Hi, this is Andy and welcome back to Med School EU. And in today's lecture, we're going to continue to talk about bioenergetics. More specifically, it will be part two of aerobic respiration, which will be composed of the, pro the process of making ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. And that means we're going to see how the electron transport chain works in order to produce ATP through chemiosmosis. So in part one of cellular respiration, we talked about the Krebs cycle in which we produce plenty of NADH molecules, NADH and FADH2. And these molecules are electron carriers that will be used to, that they'll be oxidized in oxidative phosphorylation in order to take away their electrons to power the electron transport chain and produce our ATP. So in this lecture, we're gonna talk specifically about those processes. And this is the last part of cellular respiration that will produce our product of ATP. That is the main goal of cellular respiration. So first, let's talk about the electron transport chain and what chemiosmosis really means. Here, we have a diagram of our oxidative phosphorylation. So we could call this entire process as oxidative phosphorylation because we're making uh, our ATP through the process of oxidating NADH and FADH2, these two molecules right here. So let's begin talking about the these electron transports, NADH, FADH2, that we have produced in the Krebs cycle in the previous video. So before you go on to continue with this video, you must look at the previous video for cellular respiration part one so you know where these two molecules are coming from and how they're synthesized within the Krebs cycle. So the Krebs cycle occurs here in the mitochondrial matrix. Krebs cycle happens here. And what happens is that now these molecules that we have produced, NADH, FADH2, they're gonna move over to the inner mitochondrial membrane. So remember, mitochondria has double membranes, outer and inner, and from the matrix, it's gonna move over to the inner mitochondrial matrix, inner mitochondrial membrane, where it has these complexes that are called electron transport chain and ETC and that's what the abbreviation stands for. Now what we must notice that's extremely important is the production of our protons on the intermembrane space. So as you can see here there's plenty of protons being produced there, plenty here and a lot of here and this force that is this positive force that's being produced here will be later used in order to produce our ATP. So let's see how this whole process happens and how we build up our proton motive force. So the two molecules of NADH and the FADH2, we actually produce three molecules of NADH and just one molecule of FADH2 per one pyruvate or one acetyl-CoA, I should say. And uh, because we get two acetyl-CoA or two pyruvate from each glucose molecule, we could confidently say that we produce six NADH from one glucose and two FADH2 from one glucose molecule. So what we have is the NADH goes over to the inner mitochondrial membrane and interacts with complex one. Now this complex one is called NADH dehydrogenase because it's going to remove a proton from an ADH and an electron, as you can see here, it takes an electron and a proton in order to balance out the force. So the complex one, NADH um, dehydrogenase is going to be reduced. NADH here will be oxidized to NAD plus and the proton and the electron will be moved over to complex one. Now the proton will be pumped over here to the inner membrane space while the electron will be carried over from complex one to a molecule called ubiquinone. So UQ stands for ubiquinone. I can write it right here, ubiquinone. Ubiquinone. 
and that's this is simply an energy this is a carrier molecule that's residing within the inner mitochondrial membrane and it's going to float around in between complex one two and complex three in order to pass down the electrons from these uh, electron carriers so let's see what happens at the ubiquinone well something really important happens here is that we have our electron being passed over to ubiquinone which makes it reduced and whenever we pass on an electron we must pass over a proton as well so the proton will be taken up by the ubiquinone and another electron will be taken up by the ubiquinone from FADH2 through complex 2 so complex 2 is a peripheral protein because it's it's situated on the peripheral side of the membrane and complex 2 its function is to oxidize FADH2 and take its electron and pass it over to ubiquinone so both electrons from complex 1 and complex 2 are collected within the ubiquinone and its protons and then the ubiquinone will travel to complex 3 where it's going to be oxidized meaning that it's going to lose its electron to complex 3 and the proton that was taken up over here will be carried over to the inner membrane space right here so we're continuously building up this proton force through complex 1 and ubiquinone now in complex 3 this is called cytochrome complex and it's simply going to move along the electron to another molecule called cytochrome C so this is the full name is cytochrome C and it's again a protein that's residing on the inner membrane space kind of like complex 2 however on the other side of it and it's simply just an electron carrier and what it does is it relays the electron over to complex 4 and complex 4 is called cytochrome oxidase and now cytochrome oxidase will take up the electron and it will move it over to the final electron acceptor which is going to be oxygen so oxygen is the final final electron acceptor this is really important to know because oxygen is the most electronegative atom that is going to be able to absorb the energy of the electron is going to be able to take it up and form water so one of our byproducts of cellular respiration is the formation of water because now we're going to take up two electrons two protons and again this further decreases the proton force here on the mitochondrial matrix because we're taking away hydrogen we're taking away another proton and here we're using two protons in order to create our water and at the same time <coughs> a proton is being pumped up over to the inner membrane space once again increasing its proton motive force so what happens next we have produced a vast proton motive force with lots of protons and we have made our water and the, the electron was accepted by the final electron acceptor oxygen what happens next well these protons must return back to mitochondrial matrix in order to create our balance within the the uh, electrochemical gradient so it's going to move along through the fusion uh, with a complex called ATP synthase and the the features of ATP synthase would include the stock so we can say that right here is stock uh, this piece right here this one is called a stator and uh, we have the basal unit so this right here this top part is basal unit then we move along to the last piece which is called the head piece head piece 
Okay, so th there's a s several parts that we should know about ATP synthase, but the general idea of ATP synthase is it's going to have to pass three protons in order to spin the, the stator and, and rotate the basal unit or the headpiece and it's going to pump this proton over to the other side where our ATP will be formed due to this force being carried down to mitochondrial matrix. So if we were to label what these processes are called, this right here is called the E TC electron transport chain all of this because it's the transport of the electrons from the electron carriers and this is called chemio chemiosmosis it's as the production of ATP through a proton motive force and together both of these so if we add these together they will be called oxidative phosphorylation phosphorylation ETC and chemiosmosis called oxidative phosphorylation and that's the process of how ATP is made on the inner mitochondrial membrane of the mitochondrion and we make a whole lot of ATP through this process now what we need to notice about NADH and FADH2 is that NADH comes in through complex 1 so technically the electron from NADH is going to pump over more protons than the electron from FADH2 now why is that well because NADH electron is uh, carried through complex 1 which pumps protons to the other side the FADH2 electron does not do that it goes straight to ubiquinone so it misses out on the pumping of protons from complex one so to speak which means that NADH is actually going to produce on average more ATP than FADH2 and the figure for this is that NADH would typically produce about 3 ATP per molecule because it's going to pump several electrons over or protons over and it's going to be used by the ATP synthase and if we're talking about FADH2 because it's going to avoid uh, using complex one and pumping electrons there it's going to produce only two ATP on average and these figures are not completely accurate however this is what's used for exams in high schools and these are the numbers that we should typically know for the IMAT exam. So let's sum things up with the entire process of cellular respiration and talk about the cellular respiration yield. How much ATP do we produce throughout the entire cycle? So what we have is we begin with a molecule of glucose. This is where we begin and our glucose will undergo the process of glycolysis with the 10 steps the first five steps will be energy requiring, the, sec the next five steps will be energy releasing, and overall what we obtain is two ATP molecules right off the bat, so these are done through substrate level phosphorylation, not oxidative phosphorylation because that's on the ETC, this is done through substrate level phosphorylation, so it happens at the substrate where a molecule of ATP is being synthesized. Now another thing is that we also produce two NADH molecules through glycolysis and these two NADH molecules will have to enter mitochondrial matrix in order to undergo oxidative phosphorylation in the ETC where it will produce 6 ATP. Remember how I mentioned that each NADH will produce on average 3 ATP and uh, since we're making two we'll produce six. However, keep in mind that when we are transporting 2NADH over to the mitochondrial matrix, it requires energy. So typically we use about 2 ATP in order to carry over the 2NADH to the mit mitochondrial matrix. So keep that in mind that the yield is never going to be perfect because we must use some level of ATP in order to carry over these molecules to the mitochondrial 
uh, electron transport chain where they can undergo oxidative, oxidative phosphorylation. Now the next step with uh, glycolysis, of course we produce two pyruvate molecules and what occurs next is they undergo pyruvate oxidation. Now the process of pyruvate oxidation will produce two CO2 because we are removing carbons, we're losing carbons from the pyruvate from a three carbon molecule to two carbon molecule of uh, acetyl-CoA. And uh, we, in the process, we also produce two NADH molecules and they will undergo oxidative phosphorylation at, at the ETC and they will produce six ATP as well. Now moving on, the acetyl-CoA, two molecules of acetyl-CoA will enter the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. Now here is the, le is the level where we produce the most of our uh, energy carriers. Uh, so what we have is we produce two ATP through substrate level phosphorylation, meaning that it's produced directly through the citric acid cycle. Now the other ATP are produced indirectly because we are going to produce six NADH per glucose molecule and two FADH2 per glucose molecule. Um, and these electron carriers will be carried over to the uh, electron transport chain and through oxidative phosphorylation we are going to produce 18 ATP, 6 times 3 is 18, 2 times 2 is 4, remember because FADH only produces 2 ATP per molecule, and of course we, we're left with 4 carbon dioxide as these are released as a byproduct into the atmosphere. So if we round out the, to the totals, we end up with six carbon dioxide molecules. So six carbons will be released into the atmosphere through breathing or respiration uh, because we are taken up, we're broken down completely a, a molecule of glucose which also has six carbons. So now these six carbons will be released back as CO2 and we are going to consume oxygen, remember, in the ETC and the total will be 38 ATP. However, this yield is never, never, never perfect. So you must keep in mind that we have to use a certain amount of energy to carry over molecules to the mitochondrial matrix. Also, we must know that the inner mitochondrial membrane is leaky, leaky to protons, meaning that the proton motor force is not perfect. The protons are gonna leak across our our membrane, so if this is our phospholipid, this is the inner mitochondrial membrane, and the proton will actually leak through back to the matrix, meaning that it's going to decrease the proton motor force, and not as many ATP will be produced for each of these energy carriers. So keep that in mind that this yield is never going to be perfect. Almost never the molecule achieves 38 ATP per glucose. However, this is the theoretical yield of our cellular respiration. So this concludes our two-part lecture on aerobic respiration. And in the next video, we're going to take a look at what happens to our pyruvate if oxygen is not available. And uh, the pyruvate molecules will then undergo the process of fermentation, which we will take a look at in our next upcoming lecture.